Well, my name is Harry Guger. I'm an architect and urban designer. And at the same time, I'm teaching as a professor at the EPFL, which is the Swiss Federal Technical Institute. There is two branches, one in Zurich and one in Lausanne, and I'm uh, employed in Lausanne. And then I run my practice here, which is called Harry Guger Studio. And since uh, the research uh, I do at my chair at LABA, at the EPFL, is um, very much oriented into territorial and urban design, Switzerland is not a nation state. This is very important to understand. You know? Switzerland is a confederation with a very unique, I believe, political system. Um, my wife, for example, she has recently turned Swiss and she is every time all excited about the many direct referendums <coughs> we are running. You know? So she is really, really, and for me this is normal, but for her it's very exciting to be able to vote pre pretty much on every aspect of our political and social life. And she enjoys that a lot, to be inflicted in this <coughs> very direct manner. So being a confederation is certainly uh, unique, uh, certainly in the scale, because I mean there is, a, there is a scale, you know, there is other confederation like the United States, but uh, they operate at a very, very different scale. So everything is very small scale. And then something which is also um, very important, but not too often discussed actually, that we have a a government system which acts in concordance, you know, we have not an opposition uh, political system. Uh, you are not voting for one party and then they rule the country for four years and then the next uh, vote is happening and uh, you replace the government and they start all over again. There. So there's a very high continuity in, the, in our political life because actually our government as such is set the configuration, uh, which parties have how many seats in the federal government, that's all a given. And <clears throat> if ever this is debated, then it's debated every 30 years, something like that, because one party might gain political power, and then they think that they should have more seats in the federal government, but this takes really ages. So there is a, you could say it's a slow, system, um, uh, not easy to react to very urgent issues, but I believe actually it's a very healthy and uh, sustainable political system, where not only we have this very unique federal government, but also that really actually the power lies within the community, so actually the power lies within the people. And uh, that's what I believe defines Swiss culture. Uh, having said what I just said, that I believe that in Switzerland an enormous amount of power lies with people, no? Um, in turn, you know, you have to live with a very high degree of social control. And I believe um, there's a word in, in German which is called civil courage, and maybe if I would translate this in English you might call it civic or actually moral courage. Um, and this might be sometimes very unnerving because, you know, each Swiss is actually in parallel also a policeman. You know, if you don't behave properly, you are told by your neighbors or even by people you just meet in the street. Uh, so there is kind of a code um, of social behavior which is upheld pretty much by everybody. It's a common, it's a common belief. And um, I have to say, with all its downsides, I believe that's a very good thing. So there's a very high degree of social appropriation of the public space. Uh, and in an extraordinary way, I believe, if I compare uh, on the global scale. I believe that Swiss actually are very political, as I said. Not in the obvious uh, way of uh, having opposition parties and all that. But I believe exactly because you are asked to always sort of make your statement on all the referendums, you have to be, uh, you have to be political. It's actually very difficult not to be political by default, by the system. Um, 
And the lack of ideology, I mean, Swissness, I would call this a very harsh ideology, actually, you know. I believe we have a rather strong ideology. And uh, I don't think um, uh, there is an absence of that. Um, I think there's a very clear understanding among Swiss uh, what Swissness is, and um, we would always fight for that. Now, um, this engagement of, of sort of the people, the common uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the public space and in the urban space goes uh, very, very far. You know, I could now give you two examples. Um, maybe I start with the Kunstmuseum, you know, that, um, for example, and this has not to do uh, as such directly with urban space, but um, I mean, it's quite unique that um, a city votes on whether to buy a Picasso painting or not, you know. This is, uh, but that's actually what happens here. I mean, there was a, a referendum on, on whether, because the Kunstmuseum is a public body, on whether uh, uh, the Kunstmuseum should buy a Picasso. And this, this uh, referendum was voted pro. And Picasso was so excited that he gave five other paintings to the Kunstmuseum when he heard about it. The public would have voted to buy his piece of work, you know. And in light of this and in line with that, you could say that, for example, there was a referendum on the bridge exactly over here. We have a bridge over the Rhine, the Wettsteinbrücke, where there was kind of an engineered design and uh, there was a design by Santiago Calatrava. And, uh, I mean, the, the people had the right to vote on which one to choose because um, there was kind of a competition. It's important. The bridges over the Rhine, of, of course, are important kind of public infrastructures. You could call them even public spaces as such. And, uh, unfortunately, uh, that in that referendum, sort of the sort of low-key engineered safe uh, design won vis-a-vis -vis the Calatrava design, but... I really think it caused a trauma among certain circles in, in, in Basel that they were not more uh, daring and future-looking and uh, actually choosing a color Travis design because this was even long before the Bilbao effect. You know, today everybody understands how important sort of these uh, designs are to create an identity. And I would argue if the vote, uh, the referendum on the bridge would have taken place after Bilbao, we would have the Calatrava Bridge here in Basel. In the large scale, no, and in the historic picture, I believe, uh, or you have to understand actually, that Basel um, was a very important capital of the humanist area. It was, you would call it today, you would call it, a, it was a world town. It was a place on this planet in the humanist area. And I would argue that it has managed to age in dignity. This is what this Basel. Basel was an important capital in the humanist area and has aged in dignity. That's how I would describe it. What does that mean? Um, um, you still feel, you know, I mean, you look out of this window and you see in the studio of Erasmus von Rotterdam. It's over there, untouched, on the first level. Uh, this has really um, made an imprint uh, on Basel. You have to know that, for example, Basel had the first university in Switzerland and one of the first on the northern side of the Alps in Europe. Um, so, um, uh, and it was very advanced, for example, in book printing, uh, then later on in, uh, in silk band production. And um, from where, by the way, derives chemi chemical industries and then pharmaceutical industries, which are so important today. And of course, Basel, you mentioned it, um, uh, is, a, is a border town, you know. And as such, if you uh, um, would sort of take the definition of Henri Lefebvre, uh, what is urbanity, define it by borders, differences, networks, you know, this border condition paradoxically, I think, on the one hand, emphasizes uh, uh, urbanity and on the other hand, neglects it. It's very clear, for example, on uh, the retail market, it's so much cheaper to buy in Germany, you know, you see a segregation. So retail businesses have a very hard time to survive here in the center of Basel because uh, uh, 
uh, if you would do that, you would go there on a weekend and you would take your car, you would uh, see that you have to wait quite a while at the border to get into Germany. And it's not only the Basel people, it's uh, everybody from Switzerland has a, um, a, a, do the, the, does his retail uh, over in Germany, which is actually bad. You know, there uh, this border condition kind of neglects urbanity because it starts to, think, uh, to segregate certain functions out. But then at the same time, it contributes to Basel being, I would argue, for the scale again, the size of it, uh, uh, an incredible cosmopolitan uh, city. You know, that is uh, certainly true. Um, and it's a very efficient city. It's a small scale, highly efficient place where you can reach the rest of Europe uh, in, by many means, be it uh, airplanes, trains. So it's very well connected and actually it has a very cosmopolitan uh, community, not only because of the poor condition with the Germans and the Fran Fran French coming to our work here, but the pharmaceutical industry, which actually brings the whole world to the place. Design of public space is actually uh, something which takes place over decade and decade and decade. So it's a very timely thing and it has to adapt. And so I would see it more that uh, there is many, many uh, sort of little initiatives which somehow improve the urban fabric. And if, if I would have to point at something, I think, for example, the station, the passerelle, uh, which is quite a, very, is a, quite a nice piece, actually, as a, as a piece of architecture, but also what it did, sort of uh, bringing the Gundeldinger Quartier sort of uh, more closely to the, to, the, to, the, to the town center, and actually what it triggered in the Gundeldinger Quartier um, is quite extraordinary. It's, it's a, the Gundeldinger Quartier is a typical Gründerzeit Quartier, you know, with the typical block structure. I would argue you have to find, to walk long ways to find, uh, you might find it in Berlin and other places still, but where you really find um, such, a, such a neighborhood which actually functions, you know, with sort of all the necessary amenities on the ground floors and people living above, and which is, has a very lively sort of down-to-earth um, city life, but functions very well. And this has been supported. I mean, there has been, been uh, this sort of this bridge over the tracks uh, by extending the station. And then it has been supported by several initiatives uh, from the city on improving streetscapes and so on. I guess the most critical one is an economical one. You know, I mean, we are so, the, the economy in Basel is so dominated by, by the pharmaceutical economy. Yes, there is a little bit of logistics, but if you want to draw a big picture, there is pharmacy, there is logistics, and that's about it, you know. And these are highly concentrated workspaces, uh, which somehow care for themselves. And that's actually, uh, I believe, a problem, because there is actually, you can observe this, there is a concentration of workspaces on the relative campuses, be it the Novartis model or the Roche model. So what is left is a, is a, is a need for housing. And... Um, also here I see a danger that somehow a segregation is taking place between, between somehow housing, uh, workspace and leafy space being really inflicted. So we somehow go to the campus, which is its own city, and then we come, come home uh, to live in town. And um, there I would like to see a more a distributed uh, pattern of workspace and leaf space, you know. But that, as I say, is a reflection on the economical situation here in Basel. And then what it, if it comes to the development of Basel, we, we, Basel is this typical star form, you know, of a, of a city development where the center grows into the valleys, be it the Birsig, the Birs Valley, uh, the Lange Erle, that's how Basel develops. And if you look at the system, it's often that that crucial bottlenecks between sort of the inner city and these new extensions uh, into the valleys, there are uh, bottlenecks, be it the Dreispitz, be it uh, uh, the Wolf, where uh, because of old industries, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to some, somehow transgress these bottlenecks and really weave together the urbanity which uh, happens now in the valleys and the urbanity in the inner city. 
But there's actually quite a few, you know, there is, uh, I just mentioned Wolf. Wolf is the area which now only sort of starts to uh, be discussed uh, next to the main Swiss train station towards, uh, if you go uh, towards the east. Um, quite central and uh, still uh, completely dominated by logistics. And I believe this is an area which will be in the focus in the future. Then, of course, we have the, the, the problem with the hafen, the harbor, uh, where there is again planning happening, which I'm actually rather critical about. You know, there I see for the first time a tendency uh, to leave uh, the initiative too much to the private sector. So it's, it's, I believe this is a very developer-friendly uh, development. They even create kind of a, an island by um, uh, um, re-affecting an old branch of the river. I don't like that. I think there should be more of an uh, interweaving between uh, the existing urban structures, the Klebeck areal and the harbor. And actually um, there is a lot going on because the Klebeck areal, which is mainly in you know, artist dominated, is also liberated. So also there a lot is going on and we all have to pay a very careful attention that this is, actually, as I say, you know, not to, uh, done in the neo-capitalist, uh, liberal capitalist system where uh, you somehow divide it between a few developers, but actually that this is kept. And I, I'm, I'm very trustful. You should know that there is a, there was a, again a referendum where um, the vote was that the city of Basel is not allowed anymore to sell its property. They have to, if they want to sell, they have to buy something. They need to keep the amount of property they have. And again, I mean, this was the public who uh, voted for that. I never uh, looked at the Rhine with these terms, but I like very much what you say, that the Rhine, a metropolitan public space, and I truly believe it is. You know, you have to understand the Rhine is Basel, or the fact that the Rhine finally managed to bend towards the north. You know, the Rhine uh, starts in the Grison, and uh, um, always tries to go north. He's always hindered here by the Schwarzwald, and finally he manages to finally find its way to the North Sea. And so this is a very, uh, you could call it, uh, even in geological dimensions, is, is a very crucial moment, spatial moment, no? And which, uh, of course, also uh, makes it uh, more important by its strategic position on this north-south axis. So, the Rhine, the bending of the Rhine, this is Basel. And I truly believe, you know, if you don't um, come to the Rhine, if you, uh, like many people who just drive through Basel on the highway, they really think this is the most city place on earth. You know, this is maybe the ugliest city they have ever uh, transgressed. This is uh, really, I mean, if you do that, you just drive through on the highway, you think, so what is that? Because if you go over the Rhine, uh, you have these uh, acoustic walls, you don't even uh, see the space. But then uh, once you get to this space, uh, I believe it's an incredible public space. And as you mentioned, uh, I have to repeat, the metropolitan public space, because it really acts on, as you say, local, national, transnational scale. And I believe that's what makes it great. You still have uh, the oil tankers, sort of using it as a transport route for the logistics, you know, to go to the upper harbor, because as you know, we have two harbors being a, a confederation. We have the state of Basel city and the state of Basel land, and they of course have both their own harbors. And uh, so these ships still sort of uh, go through that. And I really believe it's one of the, the urban spaces Switzerland has to offer. And if, if we take the Rhine away from Basel, there is not much left, I have to say. By its form, the bending, its dimension, uh, by its multifunctionality, uh, its leisure, uh, its, uh, its logistics. And um, yeah, I mean, that's the space which somehow makes Basel Basel. Paradoxically, I think the quality of the architecture um, is so high that the urban design suffers from it. Too often, I believe, uh, one just relates um, and uh, believes that 
as long as we come up with good architecture, everything will be fine. And not often enough you start actually from the open public space. So um, too often, I believe, you uh, it identify a problem as, as an architectural problem directly instead of uh, identifying it as, as an urban design problem. And uh, paradoxically, I believe, uh, urban design would eventually even be better if if there wouldn't be such a high architectural quality, because often it's used as an excuse or a fig leaf uh, for not thinking from the open public space, you know, and I think that always should be the starting point. And good, I mean, you know, it's their decision, but to somehow create a city like Novartis does and then make it a fenced compound and not have everybody participating in this great space. They have their reasons to do that, but I, I personally, of course, regret this, no? And uh, these campuses are such important parts, and also not, not small scale, they are important parts, and somehow they are excluded from our uh, public life. M maybe Erlen, Erlen Matte is a, was a, that's an, a former uh, Frisch um, uh, site from the German railways uh, for the, the, the freight trains which has been developed and there for example I really think uh, the master plan is actually uh, architecture dominated you know and not uh, urban space dominated having said all this you know it's very very difficult today to uh, unless you sponsor the ground floor unless you somehow don't ask for rent or even uh, even support this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, these businesses on the ground floor, you will not have them anymore. They cannot, if you ask what you have to ask for a new development for the rent, uh, no one goes there. Uh, so that's actually also a problem. How to activate the urban realm uh, in these new developments is not an easy thing because we all know the, the scale effects of our economy. Uh, things are concentrated in shopping centers. And unless you support them in one, in one or the other way, uh, these small scale businesses will, will not uh, happen anymore. I believe that developers should be forced to not ask a rent for the ground floor. Uh, they, they should alleviate uh, with the rent for the housing above and therefore give the, the space for free. Uh, certainly for the startup phase of a business, no? so that they can get established. You need to sponsor uh, the ground floor, otherwise there will be, uh, it's a, otherwise a privatization, or uh, in the worst case it's just empty space, you know, which is a dead space, which is the worst. We, we, we call this, we have the, the German word for the public space, Almend, which maybe the best word is the commons, you know, and uh, and we have something called the Alment Verwaltung, so we have the governance of the commons. And there you basically can apply for all sorts of activities, and then, uh, I mean, in most cases I know, you would get a permit unless you do a stupid thing. You want to have a Nazi demonstration or what, I don't know what, then you certainly are refused. But actually, um, and maybe this, uh, this, uh, this Almentverwaltung doesn't play an, an active role enough where they somehow advertise themselves, you know, as facilitators to have uh, more activities and maybe eventually more uh, microstructures. So to be more playful with the hardware and to make more and better use with it. And I believe that there, they are kind of, uh, yeah, they sit in their offices and if an application, but they would not promote the public space. And so a more active role from this uh, uh, governance of uh, the commons which we have, you know, that would be certainly great and would somehow trigger a more interesting, diverse use of our public spaces.